My name is Elise Wild, and you are listening to Women's Lifestyle Magazine Inspired Voices. All right, today is the first in a monthly series in which we will be bringing you stories of women in West Michigan who have made history. The series is called Her Legacy, and it is in partnership with the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council. Now, we've been publishing a Her Legacy column in our magazine and on our website for about two years. If you go to our website and search Her Legacy, you will find amazing true stories on women, anyone from a Grand Rapids woman who became the first female cartoonist in the nation to take on local issues in comic form, to Michigan's first woman licensed undertaker who also became a national leader in the industry. And we are still working on transferring every column online, so there will be more in the coming days. And today, we're going to be talking about a very special woman, Minnie Cumnock Blodgett, who with her husband built Blodgett Hospital, which we all know still stands in our community today. Uh, Minnie was an advocate for public health who made critical contributions to nursing education during World War I, and those contributions still have an impact on the way nurses are trained today. And with me to help us learn more about Minnie is Julia Baukamp from the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council. Thank you so much for joining me, Julia. I'm really excited to learn more about Minnie. Um, you know, nursing as a profession is something we're all leaning on really hard right now um, as a community as, as we go through this pandemic. So it'll be fun to learn, you know, more about um, some of the critical history of nursing that took place right here in our city. Yeah, thank you for having me and thank you for helping us do this together with um, I'm really excited to represent the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council and to talk about Minnie Cumnock Blodgett, who um, was really remembered a lot in her day for all her contributions, but who we've somewhat forgot about now. So we're really excited to honor her, her legacy today. Um, so to get started, I'll just talk a little bit about her history, and then we'll talk more about her contributions to nursing history. So Minnie Cumnock Blodgett was born in 1862 in Lowell, Massachusetts to a textile manufacturer. She attended Vassar College in the 1880s where she met Julia Lathrop and Ellen Swallow Richards, who if you're a women's history buff, you'll recognize as two very important figures in women's history and in the history of public health. Julia Lathrop was an important advocate for children's health and directed the United States Children's Bureau. She's actually the first woman in American history to direct a federal bureau. And Ellen Swallow Richards started the home economics movement and was a pioneer in the field of sanitation engineering. Oh my and God. Wow. I have to think that they were both really influential to Minnie um, because her interests ended up being very similar. She was probably encouraged by them. She was, as you said, a passionate advocate for public health and for the welfare of children. She and her husband, John W. Blodgett, who was a wealthy lumber baron, financed the building of the Blodgett Memorial Hospital, as you said, and also sponsored the Delos A. Blodgett Home for Children. And she also founded a clinic for infant feeding in Grand Rapids, which was really helpful for reducing infant mortality during the period. But as you said earlier, today we're going to focus on her vital contributions to the field of nursing. And these were contributions actually brought forward by a national um, historical event, a wartime emergency, um, the United States entry into World War I. So in 1917, Minnie Cumnock Blodgett was appointed to the Vassar College Board of Trustees, her alma mater, and she was actually one of few women at the time to serve on the board, and she proved incredibly influential. So that same year, she was approached to chair a special committee to plan Vassar's contribution to the war effort. And as the chair of this community or committee, she came up with a really remarkable and groundbreaking idea an intensive course in nurses training that would take place at Vassar during the summer 1918. And the plan was incredibly well received because at the time, people all throughout the country were fearing what would happen when nurses were deployed to help serve during the war, um, to help the wounded on the front lines. There was a great fear about what would happen when those nurses were gone, what the shortage would mean for American public health and for hospitals. Oh, gosh, so it wasn't necessarily to supply nurses to the war effort. It was to make sure there wasn't a disruption in public health here at home. 
Yeah, that's that's some people may have thought about um, shortage on the front lines, but those involved in public health and, and familiar with the problems facing the public health in the health system at the time were more worried about a shortage um, on the home front. And there were particular reasons for that, um, actually very specific to the history of nursing. So addressing a shortage was not a, a simple task. Um, I think we have a romanticized image of what historical wartime nursing was for women. We imagine uh, kind of, um, we imagine somebody excited to serve on the front lines, taking a quick course and then shipping out to help the troops. But this is precisely what Minnie Kumnuk Blodgett actually knew that she had to avoid for very specific historical reasons. So in the 1890s, starting around the 1890s, nursing leaders nationally and locally in Grand Rapids had been working towards the professionalization of nursing. They were calling for improved education standards for better working hours and for boards of registration that to be established throughout the country in different states that would set qualifications for nurses to register as registered nurses. That's where we come up with, or we're all familiar with registered nurses, but it was actually a new historical concept that was established around this time of moving towards professionalization. Um, it was a way for states um, working with nursing leaders to establish standards by which the profession um, could be regulated and maintained. So when a state nursing board was set up, they would set certain standards and nurses meeting the qualifications like attending an accredited school or and or passing a qualifying board examination could then register as registered nurses. So given then everything that nurses were doing to um, emphasize the importance of their work and the fact that their work was actually, their profession was something that required a great deal of training, not just in kind of dressing wounds or, or kind of um, busy work, but given them that they, they were trying to get increased recognition for the scientific side of their profession for everything was in it that was intellectual um, for the coursework that they had to do. Oh, okay, gotcha. So as opposed to, like you said, dressing wounds, as opposed to like the uh, like the practical side, the hands-on. Like. And, and, and of course that hands-on care was a really big part of it, but there were those in the medical perfection, um, doctors who were critical of nurses being overtrained, who wanted to protect nurses as simply doing unskilled labor and nursing leaders were really trying to emphasize that their profession was indeed a profession, not just some sort of vocational calling, but a profession that took a great deal of scientific training in subjects like chemistry, dietetics, hygiene and sanitation, um, physiology and anatomy. They were really trying to push yeah. back against the sense that nurses were simply unskilled laborers to emphasize that nursing was indeed a real profession that that required a great deal of competency and hard work and intellectual dedication as well as practical hands-on dedication caring yeah. for the wounded and the sick so before you had said that we have this romanticized view of a woman feeling the call to go help serve the country and take a quick course and that that is totally correct like that in my when we talk when, you know, when we, when this column came to us and, um, you guys let me know that it was going to be about, uh, you know, nursing about a hundred years ago, that's literally what I pictured in my head. Yeah. And so it's really interesting that that image continues to persist a hundred years later. Like that's mm -hmm. what my imagination goes to. But as you said, like that is so incredibly inaccurate and misrepresentative of this highly skilled profession. Yeah. And and nursing leaders knew that the Vassar training camp had to be um, something that pushed back against that idea as well. But they also knew, and many come like Blodgett knew, that there was a great deal of urgency. They needed 
to produce nurses who could address a potential critical nursing shortage. So what they ended up doing and what their really innovative contribution to the field of nursing was, was to take all the theoretical coursework training, the classroom, the lectures, the, basically the academic training that a nurse would get throughout the course of a two or three year period at a training school while they were also working in the hospital, the Vassar training camp decided to take all of that out and make an intensive three months course in which nurses would then get all their theoretical nurses training um, in a concentrated um, way without being distracted by the demands of the hospital because nurses in training schools at the time were also a critical part of the workforce in the hospital. And as such, hospital demands their um, time working in the hospital often took precedence over their theoretical training. But it wasn't that way at the Vassar training camp. Uh, a typical day involved getting up at 5.30 in the morning, attending eight hours of lectures supplemented by one hour of clinical demonstrations. And they were introduced to a lot of the subjects I mentioned earlier, like anatomy, physiology, bacteriology, chemistry, dietetics and cookery, hygiene, practical nursing, history, and the social aspects of nursing. And I'm just going on and on, but, but they were introduced to a wide variety of really important subjects. Um, and the curriculum was actually developed in part by a really important leader in the nursing field, um, Adelaide Nutting, who was actually at that time um, the chair of the US government's National Emergency Committee on Nursing. So there were some really important people um, working to make the Vassar Nurses Training Camp a success, in addition to Minnie Kumnuk Logic, who came up with the idea and helped plan it. And so the benefit of giving nurses all of this theoretical training over a three month period was that they were then basically primed and ready to be sent to hospitals throughout the country to undertake the practical in the hospital portion of their training. And because this was hands-on training in a hospital setting, they were also able to then relieve and replace fully trained nurses who were um, ready to go serve on the front lines in France and elsewhere. So they were able to address the nursing shortage by getting nurses in the hospitals on the home front while also um, replacing women who were ready to go to the front lines, women who were already fully trained not just nurses who had taken a quick course and were yeah. getting into that romantic idea of going off to serve. Wow, so that's like, that is a huge, what you just described is a huge shift in creating this, what sounds like a really comprehensive academic structure for nursing. Um, that's, that's huge, that's a huge, you know, that, that sounds revolutionary to that, profession and one that still has, I mean, it's when we think about things that have an impact on our society and in our daily lives, like public health is a huge one and nurses are critical to public health. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting to me that there was at some point they would be um, undervalued, I suppose, um, where in as today, I mean, as I said at the top of the, our conversation, like we are leaning so heavily on our nursing population. Um, they are just, they're critical to, to saving lives and to the, the healthy function of our community. So, yeah. so yeah. oh, go ahead. Oh, no. Um, well, and they were even more critical even as the war ended because as we know, a lot of these nurses, even though they were doing training at the hospital um, for two years at least, they might have anticipated serving on the front lines had the war lasted longer than it did. Um, as most history buffs out there will know, the war ended in November 1918. Um, but as the war was ending, a more um, even threatening and more deadly crisis emerged, the 1918 influenza pandemic, commonly known as the Spanish flu, which ended up taking more American lives than the war actually did. Wow. Um, yeah, and I think now we all, 
when we hear the date 1918, that's the first thing we think of now, because mm -hmm. even if we weren't aware of it before, we certainly are now as, as you know, as there's been comparisons drawn to what's going on now in our community. Um, so what, uh, what interesting timing with all yeah. of that. And a lot of the Vassar training camp nurses did end up fighting the Spanish influenza, um, the 1918 flu pandemic. And we do know that tragically some of them did catch um, the influenza and died while training at hospitals throughout the country, particularly at hot spots like in New York and Philadelphia. And, and like you were mentioning earlier, they were absolutely crucial to the fight against the, the influenza outbreak. Um, with coronavirus, we all witnessed how complicated it is to develop a major medical breakthrough treatment in the fight against coronavirus today. 100 years ago, doctors were at even more of a loss and even less equipped to come up with a breakthrough treatment. So the consistent care provided by nurses was especially crucial. Crucial. There was no panacea medication. Instead, it was up to nurses to give patients their best chance at recovery by ensuring things like proper room ventilation, temperature and sanitation, all whilst keeping their patients hydrated, properly nourished, resting, and attempting to treat fevers by administering cold compresses. It was really that round-the-clock care that nurses could provide that made the critical difference more so than whatever treatments doctors were trying to throw at the problem to fix it. Wow. Wow. Um, that's incredible. It's, it's uh, so how, so, so I keep thinking of, this, so this was a training camp. As we're talking, um, I'm forgetting that it's just, it's not necessarily all this the structure wasn't yet in a university setting, it was in this single training camp. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how those, the techniques and the methods and the structure they used at the Vassar training camp, how they were able to transfer that to the uh, former formal academic setting? Oh yes, and I'm really glad that you asked that question. So the Vassar training camp, even though it was a critical wartime measure, um, it ended up being a sort of experiment in nurses training that nursing leaders look to when thinking about the future of nursing education. For a while, even before the Vassar training camp um, was put into place, nursing leaders like Adelaide Nutting um, were thinking about how to improve nursing education by perhaps doing some um, more training in a university setting. And the Vassar training camp became part of a P, a focal point in a PR campaign launched by nursing advocates to both improve public perception of the profession and also to tout it as an important precedent or as a potential new way, a model by which other professions or programs, nursing programs could be modeled. And we have local proof of the effectiveness of the model in Grand Rapids. So um, a few years after the Vassar training camp um, ended and trained nurses, a few years after the camp, many come to Balaji, so confident in the idea and sure of its success, then in 1918, um, approached or was absolutely instrumental to proposing a new plan for education, educating nurses in Grand Rapids modeled after the Vassar camp. So, um, in Grand Rapids, there were three nursing schools um, that emerged throughout the 1880s and in the early 20th century, um, a school at Blodgett, a school at Butterworth, and at St. Mary's. And they were all previously training their nurses privately at these schools. Minnie's plan was to make a more centralized system by getting all the schools to partner to send student nurses to the Grand Rapids Junior College, now Grand Rapids Community College, for coursework, coursework and theoretical training. So in this way, nurses were in Grand Rapids were given the opportunity to learn in a classroom setting, free from the distractions and demands of the hospital. And they also benefited from the resources and equipment at the junior college. And this program was written about in public nursing and medical publications that would have been read by professionals throughout the country, thinking about how they could restructure their own 
programs. And so it became another crucial precedent to what we now recognize as a given in nursing education, comprehensive, some sort of comprehensive program of academic coursework that's completed outside of on the ground training in the hospital. Wow, that is, um, oh, I, got, I got like little chills when you talked about her idea to like centralize the education. Um, that's so forward thinking. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, and it also answered um, a problem that nursing leaders were considering at the time, which was how to make sure nursing education and training standards were actually more standardized mm -hmm. because they wanted the, the name or the, the term trained nurse to mean the same things to people throughout the country. They didn't want schools to be producing nursing of varying levels of standards in training and education. They wanted everybody to have the best possible training, um, the newest and the most innovative and the most informed um, by science and best practices. So centralizing the system to some degree allowed at least the nurses in Grand Rapids to have um, a more standardized um, training. And, and then there was also some talk about how it created a, a bit of a more healthy rivalry among the schools as they were sent um, to the junior college. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. So can you talk a little bit about, um, so obviously this is a massive contribution um, to public health, one that still impacts us today. That's really incredible. How did, um, did many continue to have a role in advocating for nursing and public health um, after you know, she made this pivotal contribution? Yeah, she did. Um, she died suddenly of a heart attack in October 1931 while visiting family in New York City, but up, even up to that point, she had been involved in many different public health initiatives, serving on various state boards, um, different commissions, but um, in the 1920s, she was passionately advocating that nursing schools in Grand Rapids should have endowments to ensure that they were financially equipped to train nurses um, to the best standards and with the best resources. And this was a really novel contribution according to her speeches in which she was advocating an endowment for training schools in Grand Rapids. There was no other nursing institution that had an endowment to ensure financial security for nursing training anywhere else in the country. So even up to her death in 1931, she was still advocating for nurses and still advocating for women um, and for public health and for the welfare of children and mothers. So she, she never really stopped. Um, until her death and in 1931 news of her death in New York City actually makes the front page news of the Grand Rapids press. She was such an important figure that they ran a column that went actually went on to two pages was her picture central on that issue of the Grand Rapids press. So in her own time she was an incredibly well recognized and celebrated figure. Um, people are incredibly grateful for both her contributions nationally and locally and to the many different fields in which she contributed. Wow. Um, I think that, you know, as you just described that, you know, as a, a woman in the 1930s who, whose death can make the front page of the paper and who can be mourned by an entire community and uh, on a local and national level, and I know many of us, I know personally, I had not heard of many until um, the History Council turned in the column about her. And I think that many people will probably not, not have heard of her at all before listening to this or before reading the column in our April edition. T to me, that kind of drives home the importance of, of, um, of the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council and other such organizations around the country that um, focus on women's history. This is a huge piece of history locally and nationally and it's just it's not you know it's not one that is within the common knowledge of, of people so it's that's you know to me that really illustrates the importance of, of what you guys do. 
Yes, thank you. And, and that reaction you're having is really why the Women's History Council exists. So it started in the 1980s um, when one of our founding members, Twink Frey, was doing some local history research on the history of women in the city and found little to no information out there or resources that she could turn to. And she realized that this was a big problem and that there needed it needed to change. So since the 1980s, the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council has been endeavoring to, to change that situation in which there was nothing out there. So uh, we've done this by uncovering primary sources, um, documents, uh, and, 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 and different things that can help researchers research the history of women in Grand Rapids, many of which have made their way into the Grand Rapids Public Library archives. We also sponsor research and conduct our own research on local women in Grand Rapids history. And right now we're focusing a lot on our digital resources because people unfortunately can't, we can't host or have people come to our events right now. So we've been focused on bringing events into, or bringing women's history into people's homes with digital resources. One of which we've just launched, which is, um, a, a collection of our suffrage history resources. 2020 is a hugely important year, an anniversary in women's history nationally and in Grand Rapids. It marks the 100th year since the 19th Amendment granting women's suffrage was ratified and certified. And to celebrate that, we've created a number of women's suffrage history resources focused on Grand Rapids and Michigan. Um, if your listeners and readers would like to check those resources out, they just need to go to ggrwhc.org and look for the suffrage button on our homepage. We have a digital exhibit that tells the story of women's suffrage in Grand Rapids and Michigan and a wonderful suffrage history resource guide. A lot of different things that your readers and listeners, I think, would really enjoy exploring. Yeah, and I have to say, um, you know, I, I visit your website often, and um, the, the, the digital exhibit is it's super impressive. What you guys do is so important in our community, and um, I, for one, I look forward to, like I said at the top of the show, I, we've been running the Her Legacy column for a couple of years now, and every single month I look so forward to um, the column coming in and reading it and, and just learning. and. Um, you know, local history is, you know, local history, that is what makes up national history. It's just these local mm -hmm. communities that, um, all these small vibrations that end up contributing to um, <clears throat> national events and, and things that impact all of us. So you're, the, the work that you guys do is so incredibly impressive. Um, I look so forward to when this is all over and you can have events again. So I've been to a few of them and they are really fun, but I'm so glad that you guys have, um, I know you're planning on doing the digital suffrage exhibit anyways, but I'm so glad there's ways where people can um, engage at home. And, you know, it's a great way if you're going to be on your screen, if you're going to be on your computer, um, the Greater Grand Rapids History Council website is is a great place to, to go because you can, you know, instead of just scrolling through social media, you can really learn um, about the women that have made an impact in our community and on a national level. Um, it's just, it's, it's such a fun thing. It feels so cool to be um, connected, like more deeply, I feel more deeply connected to the community um, as I learn about the women um, that you guys highlight in our column and on your website too. It's just, I encourage everyone to, to, to go to it. It's, it's a really incredible thing that resource that we have here and we're lucky to have it. Thank you. And yeah, and like you said, it's, it's just so important to know about the history of women here because when you know how many women made a difference um, in Grand Rapids history, it, it, I think it inspires women today to make a difference in their communities. Oh, for sure, um, for sure. It makes me sit up like, you know, you know, it makes me sit up like a little taller. Like I feel proud of, you know, as a woman learning about women's history, it's just, it's kind of an indescribable feeling um, to feel proud of a woman who lived a hundred years ago. 
that I've never met, but about her contribution, it's just, it has an impact on you. That's, that's kind of hard to explain. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And, and our resources are really good for any parents who are looking for um, educational resources for their children who are stuck at home right now, um, especially young girls who want to know about what women were up to in Grand Rapids history. Um, and so, yeah, we encourage all your readers and listeners to check them out and also to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and to sign up for our e-newsletter. We're putting a lot of great content out there um, and implementing um, some, we're doing content every Wednesday, calling it Women's History Wednesdays. So um, if you sign up, you'll get lots of great women's history in your inbox um, every week. I love it. Thank you so much for joining us. And then, um, as I said at the beginning of the show, this is going to be a monthly series where we're going to um, highlight the woman that was featured in the Her Legacy column of Women's Lifestyle Magazine. Um, we are, Minnie was featured in our April edition. It is now May, um, but that's okay. You can still access our April edition. And I look forward to next month. It's going to be fun. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you have any ideas for a podcast episode or if you'd like to hear from someone we haven't interviewed yet, please reach out to me at E-L-Y-S-E at womenslifestyle.com. That's Elise at womenslifestyle.com. To stay in touch with us, please visit www.womenslifestyle.com and sign up for our newsletter. You can also listen to this podcast on YouTube. Our YouTube channel is Women's Lifestyle, all one word. I hope you are all staying healthy and staying safe, and thank you so much for listening.